This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. The Word of God should become part of your daily life and taught on an everyday basis because understand this, evil is present every single day. The communication of the world to your children is every single day. It's in every song, it's in every movie, it's in everything, every game they play, all these different things, they're surrounded by evil. We are not designed as Christians to isolate our children from the world, we are taught to insulate them from the world. The world's gonna be all around them, but to have a filtering agent on the inside of them to where they they can say yes, yes, no. They know immediately where the deception begins because they understand the Word of God. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandy. It's so good to have you here today. I'm going to be taking up just today and today only, and it's called Holiness is Not Contagious. What I want to talk to you about is the fact that we need to teach our children righteousness. We need to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ because they don't just catch it because they're around us. I think one of the greatest mistakes, and I saw it in my own life and during a time period, I came through two major revivals. And I was born at the time when the first revival was going on, which is the uh, the healing revivals of the late 1940s into the early part of the 1950s. And Oral Roberts and T.L. Osborne and A.A. A. Allen and others were preaching at that time and ministry and affecting our nation like never before. And so after that time period, not that many years later, at the end of the 1960s into the 1970s, Starting about 1968, the charismatic movement came along. At that time, there was a great emphasis, not only just one subject of healing, but on the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And what we saw at that time was something that just shook Pentecostal people to the core. And that was other denominations were being filled with the Holy Spirit. Catholics were being filled with the Holy Spirit, of which even at that time, uh, Christians who were Pentecostal didn't even believe that uh, uh, a Catholic was saved because they believed in Mary. But yet many of them were. They put their full trust in Jesus Christ. And so, uh, again, Methodist, Baptist, there was even such a thing called Bapticostals. There were so many Baptists speaking with tongues. It shook their denomination across this country. This was happening by droves. But somehow, even though we went to meetings a lot, we took our children to meetings, but our children sat in children's services and things like that. It was brought them on their level, but there wasn't that much instruction and teaching in the, in the, in the Word of God in the home. And this is the major emphasis of the Word of God is teaching your children. That's why I'm offering the book on Proverbs. The key phrase in the book of Proverbs is my son. It starts out with my son. It covers it throughout the entire book. And the point of it is, is that Solomon wrote the book, but it was instruction from his father. The reason why that Solomon was successful because the, uh, he was taught the Word of God as uh, David had not done with Absalom and Adonijah. They became, they became failures. Even both of them tried to surmount and overtake David and destroy destroy his kingdom and take it from him. God preserved him. God protected him during those times. But he turned over to Solomon and Solomon continually at the beginning of his, of his life and, and the beginning of his kingdom uh, gave his father and mother much credit. In fact, the closing of the book of Proverbs was a dedication to his mother. She was the virtuous woman of which he talked about. So the book of Proverbs is instruction by parents to children, my son, and it's instruction by a father to children, mothers to children, and the importance of raising them up that way. And again, Deuteronomy, we'll be quoting Deuteronomy here later on, but Deuteronomy also tells us uh, the importance of teaching them as you walk, as you talk, as you rise in the morning, all the different ways, which is also reiterated in the book of Proverbs. So that's why this book is being offered. I know it's going to be a great blessing to you. You have an obligation as a Christian to train your children. And that's why it says that it will be chains around them and ropes around them to where they can go so far. And like it says, that they may start out, you know, and they'll be serving God. They may turn from God one day, but after a while, they're going to come back. And that's the exact story of Solomon himself. And he pointed out the fact that when you raise your children, the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, when they're older, they will not depart from it. Didn't say they won't have times of rebellion, but the, what you wrapped around them will come back to them one day because why? It was part of their upbringing. And so we often think again, because we take them to church, they'll be all right. And that's very important to take them to church, but it's important to be back in the home by the things of the word of God. Haggai, I want you to turn to the book of Haggai chapter two. That's back there where the pages are white and still stuck together because when's the last time anybody ask you to go to the book of Haggai. 
Haggai was written by a prophet, and also oftentimes the spiritual prophets would be preaching to the unspiritual prophets as we come down to the closing of the Old Testament, and we have there uh, Malachi, and Malachi gave much instruction to the uh, to the priests of his day and the prophets of his day for turning the people away from God. So in Haggai chapter 2, look at verses 11 through 14. We're going to take this kind of slow so you'll understand it. And here Haggai says, thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests concerning the law saying, or ask them this, if one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and with the edge of the garment, he touches bread or stew, wine or oil or any food, will it then make it holy? In other words, if I'm carrying holy meat with me, which is consecrated to the Lord and it's touching my garment, they even point out that the, the anointing can be in the garment. But if the garment just happens to bypass and just touch bread, stew, wine, oil, or any other food, will that food then become holy? And the priest answered and said, no, of course not. Then he says, ask this question. And Haggai said in verse 13, if one who is unclean because of a dead body touching any of these, will it be unclean? In other words, if an unclean person touches anything, does it all of a sudden become unclean? So the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is this people. And so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. What he's saying is, understand this, if I'm carrying something clean and I touch something, will it automatically change unclean things to clean things? They said, no, that's not how it works. He said, okay, if I am unclean or carrying something unclean and it touches something, if it touches something good, will that thing I'm touching good suddenly become unclean? He says, yes. What he's simply pointing out is this, is that contagious Holiness is not contagious. Evil is contagious. Holy things can touch unclean things, but it doesn't make them holy. But evil things can touch clean things and make it clean. In other words, what is contagious in the word of God is evil. Diseases can be spread. Viruses can be spread. But oh, here's the thing he's really talking about. Sin and unrighteousness can also be spread. Unrighteousness is contagious. And this is brought out here in this passage of scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33 says this, don't be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. I've seen it happen among young people. I've seen it happen among people in the church. You know, the Bible says we're not to be friends with the world. We're to be friendly with the world. Understand that you're not gonna win them unless you win them by being friendly. In other words, the old thing of, you know, that uh, honey will win, uh, will change more than, you know, uh, than uh, than sour things or not, whatever the statement is. I don't remember quite, um, but anyway, you'll win more with honey. And what's simply saying is with the world around us, be kind, be generous, be gentle to them. Jesus was, but Jesus also didn't make those his friends. Even though he hung around them at times, they were not his friends. His close friends were the 12 disciples. And also sometimes he had some close friends around him, Mary, Martha, and Zacchaeus. Jesus had friends around him, close friends that were not part of the disciples. And so Lazarus and Mary and Martha were his close friends. Whenever he was by, we'd go see them. But again, he didn't make friends with the world. And that's what we're warned about in the book of First and Second Corinthians. Strong admonition to not become friends with the world. Strong admonition in the book of James is James admonishes his congregations not to be friendly with the world. And so again, First Corinthians 15, 33, I just quoted it. But again, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Even as a Christian, when you're living for the Lord, if you hang around bad people all the time, it's not the fact that you will affect them, they will affect you. So again, it's easy to fall into sin, but you don't fall into righteousness. Righteousness is not something you just fall into. It's something that must be taught and must be practiced and grows in strength around you until one day the force of righteousness in you is so strong that you can be tempted and not fall for it. This is why righteousness takes a while. Righteousness is instantaneous when you get born again in your spirit, but a life of righteousness takes a walking in it every day. Come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. I will be your God, you will be my people. So it comes back to the old statement, a good apple will not make bad apples good, but a bad apple will make good apples bad. And so again, good friends will not make you good, but evil friends can make you evil. So it simply comes back to it again. This is what the Lord is directing in these verses of scripture. This is why I teach the word of God. 
I raised our children, not only on taking them to church, which was important, getting them involved in children's church, which was important, and a good youth group, that was important, but we backed it up with teaching in the home. And it's not that we got up every day at a particular time, had a Bible study. I know this is what a lot of people do. They have family altars. This is wonderful, but we didn't do that because it's not commanded in the word of God to have a time during the day. What is commanded in the book of Deuteronomy is make it part of your life, that when you run across things, discuss it. We'd sit down to watch TV and some of the programs we picked, you know, it says it was all right for children, but they would have some bad things. It would have some twisted things in it. It would have some liberal thinking put into it. And we would often warn the kids, kids, we know that's wrong. Let me tell you the scripture on why that's wrong. We didn't turn it off and suddenly curse that program. We let our children understand they're going to be facing these things for the rest of their lives, but they have to have discernment. And that discernment came from parents. So that when we taught this every day in the family, then one day as they left the house, they could take it with them. No longer did they have mom and dad around them to discuss it, but the word of God became like a parent to them. And it says in the book of Proverbs, it will wake them in the morning, talk to them as they travel, protect them as they go. And this is what the word of God is to do. When you raise them up in the proper way and teach them in the word of God and back it up with a lifestyle and back it up with a teaching, we would talk about not only at the, at the time of watching TV, but around the dinner table when we ate at home. Wasn't that often. I was a pastor. We ate out a lot. But we would talk around the table of the things of God. And we would talk about food. We'd talk about praying over your food. We'd talk about, we'd bring up friends. What'd you go through today? And we would talk about it from the area of the word of God. We didn't preach to them. We made it part of life. They not only uh, heard that, but they saw it. Uh, the Bible says, you know, the husbands and wives ought to love each other. So we would hug each other. My wife and I hug each other. We'd kiss each other. And I mean, the kids would often go, Ooh, you know, but you know what? They watch. This is what a, f- a father and mother is supposed to do. A man and, a, and, a, and his wife. This is what we're supposed to do. And we lived it in front of them to where it became a natural way of life. When I'd come home, I'd hug my wife. We did, we would get into arguments at times when we did in a back room where they couldn't see it. They couldn't hear it. I never beat her. I never hit her. This is not a demonstration. Even though a man physically is stronger than his wife, he doesn't use it to abuse her. He uses it to protect her. And taking those arms that probably could have just, you know, hit her and knocked her on the floor, I put it around her to protect her. That's where the boy learns the essence of what physical strength is for in a man. And that's what a girl learns. This is what I look for. A man that's going to use all that strength to protect me. This is what God has designed it for. Again, it comes back to this is what this is being taught. I have it here in my book on Proverbs. I'd really like for you to have a copy of this. I've sold many through the years. But again, it is practical wisdom. This is the book that's written for everyday life. The Bible is for everyday life as well as your spiritual example and what your life should be more for before the Lord. So this book will be available. The announcer is going to come on and tell you how you can have a copy of it. And I recommend this. Not only get a copy for yourself, get some copies for your children because I want you to take this book and mark it up. I want yellow marks on it, underlining things, notes written in the margin of the book. That's what these books are for. But then there comes a time one day when your children need this book. So get two or three copies of it, give it to them and have them begin to read it even from this time. I will see you right after the break. Many Christians are quick to confess all that they are, all that they have, and all they can do. They appear to overflow in knowledge of righteousness, healing, authority, and many other spiritual truths. Yet for all this spiritual knowledge, many of these same people are foolish and unlearned when it comes to the practical things of Christian life. As James said, my brethren, these things ought not be so. The book of Proverbs is a prime source of the wisdom we need for daily existence, and a close study of it is well worth our time and attention. In Proverbs, Wisdom for Today, Bob Yandian discusses what wisdom is, its benefits, how to find it, where it comes from, and how to receive it in order to help you live a life of wisdom. To order Proverbs, Wisdom for Today, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com.
www.ethelbrooks.com and click on Partnership. Pastors, if you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite. I want to go back to a verse we just left off with, and that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. And again, we're talking about the fact here in these verses of Scripture that uh, holiness is not contagious. Righteousness is not contagious. Sin is contagious. Evil is contagious. But righteousness needs to be taught, instructed, because, again, we don't just fall into these things. We don't just fall into righteousness. You can fall into sin, but you don't fall into righteousness. That takes a conscious decision because the world is pulling you all the time toward unrighteousness. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. We talked about raising your children correctly and right in their life. And until the time they are out from under your roof, someone needs to make the instruction to us. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That was Joshua that said that. Husbands, fathers, it's time to stand up and make that choice. As for me and my house, we will serve. Well, I don't know if I should, you know, my kids, I have a, they, they have a will of their own, no, not while they're living under your house, as far as following the Lord. As long as they're in that house, they'll serve the Lord. Well, if they decide to rebel from it after they get out of the house, well, hang on. If you, if you put the word of God in them, the word of God promises when they're older, it shall, they will not depart from, they'll come back to it. And we see this so often in life. Ministers I know that rebelled, even raised under some of the best houses souls, rebelled when they got out of high school, thought my parents were just trying to put big clamps on me. I could make up my own mind, ran out into the world and figured out a little while later, mom was right, dad was right. And that word began to bring them back and they end up being tremendous ministers. Some of the best ministers today came out of a strong rebellious backgrounds, but we raised our children that way. My son is a minister of the word of God. My daughter's married a wonderful man. They're raising godly kids. And they look back on their life and they're raising their children in the same way to talk about it. Not just bring a particular time of the day when you teach on it and make that your time. And that's all right to have a particular time of Bible study with your family, a family altar, but to make it part of your life because Jesus Christ wants to be part of every decision you make. And this is what we taught our children as they were growing up. And so this is what happened. You know, coming back to this, I trust you'll get this book, but understand this, your children are your legacy in the next generation. I had a minister tell you one time, I want to affect the next generation with my ministry. Well, then put that into your kids. Your kids carry that on to the next generation. And uh, this is what children are for, that God is having us raise children, is they become the ministers and actually take what we have taught them and increase it into the next generation. If finances can be increased into the next generation and our children can have even more prosperity than we do, then it's the same with the Word of God. They can be more spiritual than we can. And many of the people in the Word of God really outdid their parents parents and became even stronger. Uh, Solomon was wiser than David, even more wealthy than David, even though he turned from God and became carnal later on in life. David had moments of carnality. It seemed like Solomon had years of carnality, but still was an incredible man of God. And we find it again. David's father was probably a good man, but David was better than his father. And this is God's plan as we go along. He wants to have durable riches that we can hand off to our children and our children's children. And this should be multiplied but it doesn't happen if we don't keep teaching. See, Solomon failed to do that with his son Rehoboam. And Rehoboam just became a carnal man, listened to what the world said around him, and split the empire, the entire uh, Jewish nation, into the 10 tribes and the two tribes. The 10 tribes eventually became dispersed, and the two tribes that continued serving God, the southern kingdom, Judah, they were blessed. Why am I saying all this? Because, again, it's important in your life that you do this. And so, again, thank you for it. And by the way, for those that are watching right now that are partners with me, Thank you a lot. We're here today because of you and the power of God. If you'd like to become a partner, go to bobyandian.com. You'll find a place there on the website where you can become a partner with me. So a carnal believer in this world imitates unbelievers. Let me say this, that if you hang around people that are unbelievers, if you live a strong lifestyle, you can influence them. Okay, but if you don't live a strong lifestyle, they're going to be the ones that will pull you in. And it works that way every single time. Again, that verse we read, don't be deceived, bad 
company corrupts good morals. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14. Again, here we find a carnal believer imitates the unbeliever. But the pressure is there. If you become friends with the world and not only just, listen, friendly is fine. That's how you witness them, friendly with your working people around you. But to become friends with them means you hang out with them. God wants your main hanging out to be with Christians, those that are part of the church, those that understand the eternal things that you'll spend eternity with. Ephesians 5.14 says, therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead and Christ will give you life. The one who is asleep is a carnal Christian. Notice, but he's sleeping with dead people, arise from the dead. And the word simply means that a, that a carnal Christian is asleep among dead people. If you walk out to a hundred dead people, but one of them is sleeping, you have to check real close for signs of life. Look to see if he's breathing, put your finger under his nose, see if you can feel the air coming out. I mean, you have to look for the slightest little things, and that's what it is with a carnal Christian. Carnal Christians have very little evidence of being born again, except little twinges now and then. We see this with the prodigal son who ran from the house and he ended up living with sinners, he ended up in a pig pen. And that it goes on to say, they're awake you that sleep. And finally, this kid who was asleep among dead people, eating husk, just like the, the sows did and the pig in the pig pen, he came to himself. He woke up and he stood up and said, you know what? I will return to my father. And when I get there, I'll say this. Well, he did. He returned to his father. This is what happens because the son was raised right, but one day just took it on himself to rebel, and he did. Righteousness does not beget more righteousness. Sinners bring sinners into the earth. Here's the other point. Righteous people bring sinners into the earth. Your children are not righteous because you're righteous. Sin is the overwhelming power in this earth because Satan uh, came, tempted Adam and Eve, and they came into this earth, and their children were born sinners. Sinners begat sinners, but righteousness is around them and the word of God is around them, and there's people preaching around them. And so you're a sinner because you're born from Adam's transgression. At our birth, Adam's seed is greater than Jesus' seed. But at salvation, Jesus' seed in us is greater than Adam's. But unrighteousness still continues into the next generation because even if you're a born-again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking Christian that knows the word of God inside and out, what can happen is it doesn't continue to the next generation. Your children are born born sinners. You are not a Christian because you were born into a Christian family. And so it still goes even further than that. You can hang around as a sinner. You can hang around Christians, but it doesn't make you a Christian. You can go to church. It doesn't make you a Christian. Uh, you can talk about Jesus. It doesn't make you a Christian. Only giving your life 100% to Jesus Christ, making him your Savior and your Lord. At that moment, that's what happens. You believe in the uh, fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You accept him as your Lord and Savior. But even then, there's such a power of the world. If you don't watch it, you can be dragged back into unrighteousness. You'll become the carnal Christian. You'll become a Christian who looks and acts just like the world, asleep among the dead. But you need to fight that. And the way you fight it is by studying the word of God and praying, especially in the Holy Spirit, in tongues. When you study the word of God and apply it to everything in life, it gives you power to overcome it. And eventually, after you walk in it enough, you have a power to daily walk free from it. In other words, you're walking on water. Walking on water becomes such a common thing that you don't even think think about it anymore. You've been walking on water for so long, you don't even think about it. You've been swimming upstream according to the world so long, you don't even think about it. Salvation and righteousness is usually shared from one person to another. This is called the Great Commission. But daily righteousness, discipleship can be shared person to person, but mainly comes from a minister to a congregation. The daily righteousness we walk in can be written in a book and we study it. It can be shared across a lunch table from Christian to Christian, or it can be watched on with television. But again, the main thing that comes back to it is it's taught in a church service. We see the man at the gate beautiful in chapter three of the book of Acts. And the man was there. He'd been laid there for a long time. Peter came along and John came along. And Peter said, we don't have silver and gold. That must have been a depressing thought to the man. He probably was looking to them. And the moment they said that, he probably started looking towards someone else because these guys are broken. But Peter said, but what I do have, I give to you. Reach down and took him by the hand 
and said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man stood up, began to walk and leap and praise God. Now, praising God means that about the second or third leap, he accepted Jesus as Savior. He started out as a as a unsaved man who was healed miraculously, but taking that miraculous healing, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And as soon as he went walking and leaping and then praising God, he accepted Jesus. The next phrase it says was he followed them into the temple. That should be be the strongest thing. Why? Because if we're not to fellowship with the world, who do we have fellowship with? We fellowship among those that are in church. We're to do good to all men, but especially those of the household of faith. This is where our close friendships are made from righteous people in this earth who follow Jesus Christ on a daily basis. And that's how we grow in the things of God. We study it personally from the word of God and we hang around people that believe it and and act on it and operate in it every single day. Daily righteousness us again. Discipleship can be shared person to person, but mainly it comes from ministers in a church to the congregation. Family evangelism usually comes from parents to children or oftentimes from children to children, brothers toward sisters, sisters toward brothers, and from one generation to another as you witness to uh, you know an older generation or they witness to you. And so this is what happens. Again, it doesn't come simply because you're born again. You don't just automatically, even born again, just fall into righteousness. It's much easier to fall into sin, but preparing yourself means you can be tempted and not fall for the temptation of it. I said at the beginning of this broadcast that Deuteronomy had a lot to say about training up your children. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter six. I want to read verses one and two. This is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your generation, your grandsons, all the days of your life and all your days may be prolonged. Jump down with me to verse six. And these words, which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently today to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Notice again, the word of God should become part of your daily life and taught on an everyday basis because understand this, evil is present every single day. The communication of the world to your children is every single day. It's in every song, it's in every movie, it's in everything, every game they play, all these different things, they're surrounded by evil. We are not designed as Christians to isolate our children from the world. We are taught to insulate them from the world. The world's gonna be all around but to have a filtering agent on the inside of them to where they can say, yes, yes, no. They know immediately where the deception begins because they understand the word of God. In Genesis through Numbers, Moses is teaching the people, but Deuteronomy is the teaching repeated from parents to children. In fact, the name Deuteronomy means to say it again. And Proverbs tells the importance of parents teaching their children. My son, Proverbs 1.8, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother, the importance of it. So again, I'd like you to have the book. Be sure to get a copy of it. I'll see you next time. You can order resources become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.